Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing today? We're so excited everybody made it for the service. We want to say good morning to all of our online campuses today. And I want to encourage everybody, as we start worship today, let's put to use those nine forms of worship that we learned about last week. Let's start to implement those this morning. Right on? Okay, let's get started. Sing, 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 and make music with the heavens we will. Sing, 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 grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Lift high the name of Jesus. What's not to love?
Lord, we just thank you so much, Lord, this morning. We just want to enter into that time of worship with you this morning, God, and just recognize you for who you are today, God.
tired. Some of you guys may have come in here full of energy and full of life. But either way, it doesn't matter because the Lord is here to meet with you this morning. He is that burden that is light. He's that yoke that is easy. He wants us to be the ones that will lift our voices and sing our song of praise and hold nothing back from him this morning because we want to be those worshipers that he can come and he can begin to dwell with because we lift up a song of praise. We lift up our voices and we sing glory, glory, glory to the Lord. You are holy, God. You are holy, God. Let's lift that up. love you so much, God, and we just love to just continue to just sing, Father. Lord, it just brings our souls such joy when we can just lift up our praise and lift up our worship to you, God. And so, Lord, let that song just fill our mouths, Father, every day as we come and we worship you, Father God. Lord, we just thank you, Father.
You guys may be seated. We just want to welcome everybody here to Joy this morning. We want to welcome again our online campuses. And thank you so much for being a part of our service today. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? It looks like it's going to be a nice, hot, sunny day outside. Well, right now we're going to receive our tithes and offerings and uh, anyway I was looking at this report and uh, 2009 Tiger Woods had fallen from grace he had gotten in some trouble he was the number one athlete of the world paid but shortly after his crash on on Thanksgiving Day everything went downhill for Tiger Woods he lost like five sponsors and that cost him like 50 million dollars well, last year in 2012, he, he was the top number one athlete of the year, right? So he had, um, through sponsors, he had made $78 million. 13 of them was his salary and 65 was uh, endorsements that he had received for that year. Well, every time that Tiger Woods lays his head on a pillow, he's making $213,000 every t each day of his life. Amen? Who wants to be like that? Amen. Yes, 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 yes. But have you ever heard the expression, money isn't everything? But if it's not everything, it, it surely can come into second place, you know. <laughs> it's far ahead of everything else. <laughs> Some things, but things that money can't buy. Money can't buy love. Money can't buy joy. Money can't buy a good marriage. Money, there's a lot of things money can't buy, right? And, and only, you know, like 
God can come into your life and he can give you that peace and joy and he can satisfy your mind. Amen. So money isn't everything, right? Amen. But it sure does help. So let's read our scriptures. Oh, you would have to do that. And, and yet, better to have one handful with quietness than two handfuls with hard work and chasing the wind. Amen. So no matter what our circumstance, what befalls us in life, right, we have to look to God as our source, as our resource. And, and money is just a tool. Money is something that we make investments. We make investments in our family. We make investments for our retirement. We make investments to the house of God. Because God can use our money for a purpose. And when we put God first with our tithes and offerings, God only enriches our lives. He's the one that is our provider, and he's the one that blesses us totally each and every day of our life. Amen? Amen. So go ahead, ushers. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well this morning. My name is Allie. And I'm Thomas. And we want to invite you to get involved in our Connect groups. They are our Bible studies. They happen every week. If you want inf information on how to get involved in those, you can go to the info booth or visit us at joychristianfellowship.com. Awesome. Also, if you're new here, we offer a journey class every Sunday at 6 p.m. right here at the church. And it's for anyone. It's a four-week class that's looking to become part of the Joy family. So we want to invite any of you that haven't gone through that class or would like to, to come on out on Sunday nights. And on Sunday, July the 14th, we're having our second picnic. It's going to be a great time. That's at the Gold Hill KOA, directly following the service. It's $2 per person. We ask that you bring your own main dish and a dish to share. Plus, that day, we will be having a see you soon reception for Pastor Jake and Bethany. So please be there to tell them that we'll see them soon. It's going to be a great time. That's July the 14th. Awesome. And Circle Youth Ministries, you have some awesome events coming up. The first one is your CYM Outbreak, which is the soaked Woo! service. It's going to be an all-out water war. It's going to be July 13th at 6 p.m. And also you have your Unshakable Youth Camp yeah. coming up August 19th through the 23rd. It's $150 if you pay before August 7th. But if you wait, then you're going to have to pay $20 more. So make sure you get signed up for that out at the info booth. Well, that's all we have for you this morning. Have a happy 4th of July, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. We're going to pray over the offering now. Father, we look to you as our source. And Father, we thank you that you are a provider and you are the one who blesses our lives, thank Father. And we thank you for you and everything that you do. And, and bless this offering. Bless the usage of it. And Father, we just thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our lives. And we just bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Right now, children are dismissed to go to their classes. And we're going to continue uh, on the worship series. Pastor Steve is going to be teaching via video because he's on vacation. And, he, and we're going to watch a video called His Majesty. Amen? So go ahead and play the video. Online streaming. Uh, this morning I am on vacation, but... Uh, I want to imitate the Lord who is everywhere present, so uh, I pre-recorded this message to be shown uh, by, by streaming and also by video at uh, Joy, and so I'm having a good time. I should return a little bit more tanned with my family, a little bit more tanned, possibly a little bit more plumper. I definitely want to avoid anorexia and bulimia at any, any cost, so we're probably having a good time. But we really want to continue on in this series on worship, and we want to keep feeding the flock of God. This is session nine of our uh, teaching on uh, worship His Majesty, or stay calm and worship on. This morning I'd like to talk to you about a change in a worship plan that God instituted in Acts chapter 15. Uh, Many people who attend Joy Christian Fellowship or possibly you've been viewing our online stream, you will see that uh, there are some things that you might consider to be radical worship expressions, like shouting in the midst of church, you know, shouting to God with a voice of triumph or lifting up of our hands, singing, dancing, bowing, kneeling, uh, standing uh, in the presence of the Lord, 
speaking our praise to God, singing out, and all kinds of exuberant forms of worship. And, and uh, many people feel this is just kind of a phenomenon that, that, that happens in certain types of churches, uh, black churches or Pentecostal churches. And, and many people feel like, well, some people are just excitable, and that's just a, a cultural thing that, that uh, people are loud in church versus people are quiet in church. Well, I believe that the Bible teaches us that there are, are right and wrong ways to do anything. From the building of a boat, there was a proper way to construct the, uh, the um, ark that, that Noah uh, rode in, Noah's ark. It was given specific instructions, please build it this way. And then in, in the wilderness, God spoke to Moses and even clear back into Egypt and saying, hey, uh, I'm going to pass over and I want a certain type of a lamb set aside at a certain time and on a certain day, this spotless lamb is to be, is to be killed, it's to be eaten and cooked in a certain way. God is specific about his preferences and the things that he likes. So for someone that maybe has been observing our worship at Joy, your conclusion may have been, well, they probably just kind of stumbled into that. The actuality is, is that like so many other things that we do here in God's house, we've looked at scripture and we have scriptural reasoning for why we do what we do. Uh, it would be as easy to calm everyone down and say, listen, let's come into the house of the Lord and let's all just be reverent and, and sit there quietly and, and uh, open up your, your hymnal or observe the screen for the words and, and everyone stay really proper. That, and we, we certainly have the leadership capability to do that. So you may ask, then why do you allow the children to come down front and people are just overtly worshiping? And that's because God changed his call in the form of worship early on in the church age. In, in Acts chapter 15, we see that God speaks through James and brings up a prophecy from clear back in Amos about the rebuilding of David's tabernacle. I want to look at that today, but I want to address the form of worship that you see us practice at Joy. We call that New Testament worship, or we call that Davidic worship. In that, we're, as we see in Scripture, and we're going to carry on in looking at that, in Acts 15, there was a change of venue. Because Jesus and his disciples, they weren't leaping and dancing and lifting up of hands and bowing and clapping and all of these various means of worship. But we find out that David had, in Acts 15, we see where the Lord had, had or the Holy Spirit had redirected uh, the church to, to rebuild David's tabernacle. And so we want to use that as a basis of, of giving you the biblical reasons for the reason we worship the way that we do. In Acts chapter 15, verses 12 through 17, it says this, Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. This is taken out of Acts chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Now to contextualize what was going on in Acts 15, there was this great council that was been, being convened at the Jerusalem church, which was the first region where, where Jesus had laid his own life down as a sacrifice. He was 
He was raised from the dead in Jerusalem, and he, he preached and he began to establish his followers into what we call the church there in Jerusalem. After he had been with them for 40 days, he ascended into heaven, and 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit began to, to break out among the, the people, and, and Peter got up on the day of Pentecost, and he preached, and he opened the door to people to be saved. Now, if you, if you don't understand the people he was preaching to, they were Jewish worshipers who had gathered from various parts of the Middle East, and they had all come back for the Feast of Pentecost from places like Greece, Spain, uh, Turkey, Egypt, Armenia, Bulgaria, different like modern countries. Jewish believers had come from those places to worship Jehovah God or Father God. In the middle of all this, the, these followers of Jesus who believed that no longer following Moses but following Jesus was the way of life, these believers, the followers of the way, the way of Christ, they, they had followed the words of Jesus and they had been praying and seeking God, waiting for this visitation of power from on high to visit them. And it all began to happen with them speaking in tongues and, and, it, and it cloven tongues of fire or separate tongues of fire fell on the 120. They spilled out into the streets prophesying and speaking the mysteries of God. And, and this multitude heard the mysteries of God being spoken by these individuals, each in their own distinct, distinct tongue. And so that was where the Pentecostal experience was first manifested. And it seemed to be a change of venue or a change of plan of God. But yet, yet throughout his walk with us, Jesus had spoken of the gift of the Father and of, of that the Holy Spirit would come and that you were to ask and seek and knock for the, the Holy Spirit. And, and so this gift of the Father that they didn't understand would show up as tongues. It happened. And suddenly there was a great zeal to begin to preach the gospel. And so Peter explaining to all of these Jewish people who were seeing these 120 people early uh, in the morning thinking they were already drunk, he said, they're not drunk with wine, but this is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophets that in the last days God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And the sons and daughters would prophesy. And he goes on, and 3,000 of these Jewish believers receive Jesus Christ, and the church begins to grow, which means that they didn't have church buildings, they're, they're what they, they, they didn't have like a central office, so to speak, but in various homes, people began to convene, and they, would, they began to be uh, under the teaching of the apostles, and, and, and they were being formed into the people of God, but it was a Jewish church. Now, it's interesting because in Acts chapter 16, when, when Jesus had spoken to Peter, he said, Peter, you've recognized me as being the, the son of God, and I will give to you the keys, not a key, but keys of the kingdom. And so one of the first doors that, that Peter was used was he opened up through his preaching the door of life to the Jews. Now, Peter himself, as well as most of the Jewish believers, had read Jewish history, which, which predominantly had a very hostile view of the Gentiles. Uh, Abraham himself, being a Gentile, was called uh, out, and, and uh, it wasn't until uh, three generations, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, that the 12 sons began to form the tribes, and, 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 and that would be this nation of people that we know as Israel or the Jews came from Abraham. But Abraham himself was essentially a Gentile called to follow God and be separated. And so, so God began to isolate the, the Jewish people and he said, you've got to be separate from the nations and you've got to be a holy people and you've got to represent me as a light to the Gentiles well, over the process of generations, that whole concept of 
that there was ever a plan for the Gentiles began to be eradicated from the consciousness. And, it, and that consciousness was filled with prejudices that said the Gentiles were dogs and they were outsiders and, 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 and they speak with foreign tongues. In fact, the word barbarian, I, I understand, comes from a, like a word barbar, uh, which was kind of a, an imitation of, of someone uh, imitating a language they don't understand. Well, he's a barbar. He's, he's just a blah, blah. He's someone we don't understand. He's a barbarian. And so that was the concept that the Jews had for the Gentiles. And so Peter, uh, living in those prejudices, was seeking God in, in one morning when God began to give him a vision of, of unclean animals coming down on a sheet from heaven. And God said, Peter, rise, slay, and eat. And he said, Lord, I, I've never eaten any unclean foods. And, and, and so God spoke to him, said, what I call clean is clean. Do not call unclean what I call clean. And then, then God began to speak to him that men were going to come and call for him. And he was to go with them. And as this vision is happening, he's getting a knock on the door. And God had raised up a Gentile, a centurion by the name of Cornelius. And Cornelius had sent a contingency from Caesarea down into Jerusalem to fetch Peter. Holy Spirit has to tell Peter, I'm going to take you past your prejudices. I'm going to open up the door, or actually, Peter couldn't have even handled that yet. He did it by surprising Peter. And so the, 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 the gentlemen, they come and they say, our, our leader, our master, is Cornelius of the Italian band, He's a godly man. He prays to God daily. He gives to the temple. He gives alms. And so, so Peter is being instructed, go with these people. And he goes up, which was almost unheard of, that someone would travel with the Gentiles and really break bread with them. Now, Jesus had consistently reached out to Gentiles, but that wasn't enough to, to break down the prejudices in his own disciples' minds. He'd touched the Syrophoenician woman. He had healed a centurion's servant. And, and a number of times we see that Jesus would speak about righteous Gentiles, like the, the story of the Good Samaritan. But these people were still seeing the Gentiles as outside of salvation. And God was going to use Peter to take another key now to open up not just the door to the, to the Jews, but to open the door to the Gentiles. And so Peter arrives in, in, in uh, 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 Joppa, I believe it was. Uh, please forgive me for just recounting stuff from my memory. It was either Joppa or Caesarea. I believe it was Joppa. And he arrives there, and, and, and Cornelius says, the Lord spoke to me that you would tell us the way of life. So he had his whole household gathered, and when Peter arrived, they all met in some kind of a courtyard or large seating area that they had, and they were all listening very uh, attentively to Peter. And Peter began to talk about uh, the things of God. And while he's preaching, the Holy Spirit pours out on all these Gentiles, and they don't even respond to an altar call. They are spontaneously beginning to speak with tongues which was something that was now among the early church. That was a sign of someone who had been repentant, called on the name of Jesus, and were now being uh, equipped to do all the work of God. That was what happened when you began to practice your prayer language and speak in other tongues. And so, so Peter says, well, wow. If God has shown his sign of approval by baptizing them with the Holy Spirit, who's to forbid water? And he baptized the group. And at that point, then the door was opened for Gentiles to be saved. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, those prejudices were still existent. And so when Peter came to Jerusalem and he met with James and the other apostles, they said, let's, let's hear it out in, in the general assembly. And so Peter tells the story before the church in Jerusalem and before the, the gathered apostles and interested uh, hearers, and he begins to present a case for the Gentiles to receive Jesus Christ. And so 
James, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, here in this context, in, in Acts uh, chapter 15, he goes, I get it, verse 15. And, after, and with this, the words of the prophets agreed, just as it is written, after this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that the, note this, rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. So James, the Lord's brother, reveals that God wanted to rebuild something that had occurred in the Old Testament and reestablish it in the New Testament so that the, the, the consequences of all men having free access to God could be accomplished. Now, in, in, in a short period of time, Peter, having been pulled out of his prejudices, thinking the Gentiles were not sought by God and they were outside the covenant of faith, the covenant of Israel, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit leads him to begin to preach the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, and they began to receive the faith, and they began to speak in tongues. Now James, led by the Holy Spirit, begins to open up a whole new concept because the tabernacle of David was a place of, of magnified access to the presence of God based on the heart of David, based on David being a, a type or a, 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 he was a, an Old Testament type of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the son of David. And David, if you look at David's life, there are, are so many ways where, where David was, was a picture of Jesus who was to come. David was a king, but David was also a prophet. And he also functioned offering sacrifice to the Lord as a priest. Other kings tried that. They were not permitted. David, because of his heart and of, of what God was doing in his life, he was a precursor of Jesus, the, 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 the prophet, priest, and king. And David was a prophetic guy, and he had created an atmosphere of worship, which was very radical. It's where there was dancing, and, and there was whirling and there was lifting of hands and, and, and great joy and blessing among the people of God. And it was considerably different than any other form of worship that Israel uh, had, had uh, seen. And, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about this tabernacle of David because the purpose of God restoring this, this tent, the tabernacle which had fallen down, God says, I'm going to rebuild it and the rebuilding was evidenced by this initial act of, of Jesus dying on the cross, raising again, sending the Holy Spirit, beginning to save the Jews, now saving the Gentiles. And James gives us a tip off that God was going to do more as he rebuilt fully the tabernacle of David. Jesus' sacrifice was the beginning of the restoration of the tabernacle of David, but more was to follow. Now, uh, James, the brother of the Lord, he had said uh, that the words of the prophet agree, just as it is written, after this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David. One would say, well, what prophet? Where is that taken from in the Old Testament? And the answer is the prophet was the prophet Amos, and in Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, it says, On that, that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. <laughs> Interesting. In the middle of... Prophetic utterances in the middle of Amos ministering to the very sinful house of Israel and, and the house of Judah was as sinful. In the middle of the dark days of the Old Testament before the uh, falling of, of Israel and then the subsequent fall of, of, of Judah, 
we see a prophet stands up as a bright light and speaking of a time when God was going to move and restore David's tabernacle. The thing that, 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 that set David as so unique, uh, as not only a king and a, and, a, and a holy man, but it was a heart that sought God spontaneously without having to be coached. When you, when you look at the life of David, David did not come from a royal line. He did not come from, uh, from uh, a priestly line. He came from the tribe of Judah. And he was simply and ostensibly called by his knowledge to simply be a man of the field and a man uh, of farming. His, his family, Jesse, and, and, and his lineage and it does run through Boaz and, and others. They were, they were farmers. And so you didn't necessarily need to construct instruments of worship and sing psalms to God to be a farmer. Uh, many of the farmers that were even devout, they, they weren't deep into singing to God. They weren't deep into worship. They would show up to the, pre, to the festivals and they would bring their sheep and they would bring their goats and they would offer sacrifice. But it was kind of a formal worship arrangement if we honor God with our first fruits and if we come before God and and do these things then he'll bless our land and and we'll have victory over our enemies now in that in that setting comes this young man who was so insignificant that when when Samuel came to anoint the new king of, of Israel that that uh, Jesse did not even think of David, but as an afterthought, because he was the uh, red-haired, ruddy complexion, small, younger brother who was out tending the, the lambs and the sheep out in the field. But David was not just in that field tending the sheep. He was out in that field developing a relationship with God, which uh, was, was a deep character to where he would even risk his life to defend sheep. And he, he would risk his life against a lion and, and a bear and, and seize them by the mane <laughs> to shake out the lamb. And if the, the, lamb, if the, if the animal did not release the sheep or the, or the uh, lamb, he would kill it. And he had killed a lion and he killed a bear. Now that's a deep character. That's kind of beyond the assignment. I think most fathers, if they're, their child came in and said, well, we lost, we lost an animal and I, I chased the, uh, the marauding lion away, but it did take a lamb or a sheep or the bear got one. Uh, most farmers would say to their son, well, that's just collateral damage. We have plenty more and, uh, you know, you did good to, to scare it away. But David had such a conviction, it wasn't just good enough to scare the animal away uh, with its loot. He would pursue it and demand justice. And so this was the spirit that David had as a, as, a, as a man all through his life was he wanted right and he opposed wrong all the days of his life. He understood authority that was developed not by the highlight but in the low light, the dim light of the hidden valley where his character was being formed. And the Bible said that he was a tremendous harp player. I don't think that he took weeks off of sheep tending to go take harp practice. I think he took that simple harp into the field with him. And there he, he was constructing songs of praise. The, the psalms are, are spontaneous songs of, of David singing of God's creation, of his majesty, of his power, of what it's like to be shattered and broken before God and for God to restore your life and rebuild you and and David was the sweet psalmist of Israel, but he was also the greatest king of Israel. And he was the one who, who wanted the presence of God. He sought the presence of God wherever he went. And he loved when he could be near the Ark of the Covenant, where, which represented the virtual throne of God was seen as, as God rested between the wings of the cherubim and, and God uh, the glory of, of God shone forth from the ark. And so God, David loved the presence of the Lord. And he loved the ark of the covenant. 
Now, King Saul, his predecessor, had, had uh, never really sought God. There's no record of him ever going uh, to the worship uh, and, and, and spending time in Shiloh uh, to seek the Lord and, and, and be around the, the Ark of the Covenant. And, and so it just didn't happen in his, his watch. And so the Ark of the Covenant had almost become like a magic symbol to, to Israel. They didn't seek God's presence, but if they were going to go to battle, they would bring the Ark with them. They felt that would cause their enemies to be defeated. Well, as we know on that faithful day that David, where Saul was actually killed in battle, they, they had brought the Ark out and they had positioned it in front of the Philistines and they, they shouted with great joy like our magic box is here and so we can't lose. And they were defeated in battle and so the Ark of the Covenant was actually captured and taken into the land of the Philistines. And so at the very battle where the Ark was taken, that was the, the beginning of the transfer of the kingdom because Saul lost his life in that on the Mount of Gilboa. And very quickly, David was taken by his own people, by the, the tribe of Judah, and they made him king in Hebron. And for, and for seven years, he was the king of Hebron before he became the king over the United Kingdom of Israel. And then at that point, he, he desired to make his, his place Jerusalem. And then he began to desire that he would bring the Ark of the Covenant, which had, had, was returned from the land of the Philistines because they were breaking out in sickness and disease and having problems. And so they put the Ark off into another place and Kirjath Jerim. And, and for a number of years, the Ark was not in a central city and it was not in, in uh, the capital city where the king lived. And so David had this heart to bring the Ark of the Covenant. He had tried to bring the Ark of the Covenant, but he hadn't done his research and he didn't respect the presence of the Lord. And so a man was killed as he reached out. Uzzah reached out to steady the Ark and he was zapped by the power of God and he was lost his life. God saying, I want to be respected. You've got to respect me and honor me and how you transport the, the ark and how you worship before my presence. And so we look in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and I'm going to read to you some verses about David desiring that the ark be returned to Jerusalem so that he could make a place for it in his capital city. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. In the interim, after, uh, after Uzzah was uh, killed, uh, David said, we need to re regroup. And so they took the ark and they put it in a guy's house named Obed-Edom. And for about three to six months, there was this major blessing hitting this man's house while David was going back and inquiring of the Lord. And David was initially angry. Because, you know, the thought is, I'm trying to bring your presence into the city. I'm trying to do you good, God, and then you're killing a man here. And, and, and so uh, uh, one of the portions, I think it's in Chronicles, it says that when David began to see that, that the ark was to be conveyed by the Levites, then he had the peace to go back in. And he saw that for the time that the ark was in the house of Obed-Edom, that everything that pertained to Obed-Edom was being blessed by the presence of God. And that was one of the keys of David. He felt that everything in his life would be blessed if he brought in the presence of God. And so it says here that uh, uh, David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Now, I, I haven't calculated how many miles uh, it was from the house of Obed-Edom up to, up to Zion, to the high place in the uh, city of David, Jerusalem, and then Zion was the spot where the tabernacle of David was erected. But every six paces, even if it was just a few miles, which it, it wasn't, <laughs> it was from the edge of 
of the coastal area, clear up to Jerusalem, every six steps they're offering sacrifice to the Lord. That's a lot of sheep. That's a lot of worship. And they're doing it with gladness. Verse 14, Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with singing and with the sound of the trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle. Now, the the term tabernacle here just simply means enclosure or tent. They they did not use uh, the term tabernacle if they were speaking of something that was a permanent uh, stone and 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 uh, you know roofing kind of a structure. Tabernacle means tent, and so they're bringing the ark of the covenant and they're placing it not in the tabernacle of Moses which I believe was still at Shiloh at this time. And so, so they were conducting the form of worship. That was still going on down. And so everything looked like worship and all that was going on in Shiloh, but there was no Ark of the Covenant, no presence of the Lord. And David's literally bringing the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the Lord, into the city, into his, his spot of rulership and and, and, and acknowledging the authority of God over him. That's why he did not wear his kingly robes, but he put on the simple undergarments, uh, the ephod of, that the priest and the common people would wear. And he was dancing and, and, and rejoicing before God, and his own wife despised him in her heart. She felt like he had shamed himself because of how much he loved God. And it says here that he set... It, the ark in the, in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed everyone to his house. Very interesting. So David had, had brought the ark up to Zion, the city of David, and Zion being a section of Jerusalem, and that was this, this special holy place that he had selected to put the presence of the Lord. Now, we know that there was another tabernacle, the tabernacle of of Moses. And you'd say, what is the difference? Why didn't David just transport the tabernacle of Moses up to the city, set it up there, and put, put the Ark of the Covenant? And the reason is, is because God was showing what New Testament worship was going to look like smack in the middle of the Old Testament time. You see, the, the, the tabernacle of Moses had, had, it was surrounded by a fence that, that would keep all of the, the non-Jewish people out. And so, they, so the Gentiles were outside the fence, and that was the prejudice that the Jewish people had, had felt, that, okay, the fence that surrounded the tabernacle of Moses depicted the fact that only the selected people had access to God. Then inside, there was uh, the tabernacle was made of dolphin skin, or the Old, Te- the, um, Old King James calls it uh, badger skins. And so you had this miniature house, and, and, and then out there, the, the, the people of Israel, the covenant people, could sit. And then when the priest would go inside the tabernacle, of Moses, there was the holy place, which was um, filled with a, a brazen altar and a brazen, uh, excuse me, out in the courtyard was the brazen laver and the brazen altar. So there was washing, cleansing, and sacrifice was done where all the believers could view this happening. And when they went in, 
to the tabernacle, only the priests could go in there and they would be before the altar of incense and the altar of showbread and the, the golden candlestick. And these were pictures of the word of God and, and the work of the Holy Spirit. But in behind the veil was where the ark was and only the high priest once a year could go there. And it was called the Holy of Holies and it was where the presence of God was. And only one person once a year ever had the opportunity to go in and be right in the Holy of Holies. It was such a fearful thing that they would tie a cord around the high priest's ankle. So if he wasn't sanctified and prepared and he was knocked dead, then they could drag him out, you know, dead and bury him. Now, all of a sudden, David is putting the Ark of the Covenant not with the same elaborate setup of distinctive steps, but he's putting the, the Ark of the Covenant in a, in a simple tent and outside the tent were, were just a, a simple place where they would offer burnt offerings and sacrifices. There's no record that they had the brazen laver outside the tabernacle of David. Because see, in the New Testament, by one sacrifice, we are cleansed and we are made uh, acceptable to go before the presence of the Lord. And David was, was by, by type, was showing that there's access to God now. Now, it's very interesting because anyone who was in Jerusalem could go where, where the worship was going on outside the tabernacle of David. Now, watch this. Not just Jews went to Jerusalem, but many people from all over the world. During the time of David, they would come in and they would, they would see the Jews worshiping God under King David. And they're outside the, 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 uh, the tabernacle of David and they're worshiping and they're singing. And David had raised up musicians and people and they were playing instruments and they were having this amazing worship celebration. And even the Gentiles could come. And when they would draw near, there were Gentiles that would begin to feel the presence of God. And they, they began to become proselytes. They began to be people that said, we would like to become a part of God's people too. And so the tabernacle of David was a place of access of God, a place of where the, the, the people could draw closer to God and the unbelievers would draw close to God as well. Now, it's very interesting because when James had this revelation back in, in Acts chapter 15, he brought up the thing that Amos had also brought up, and that was that the rebuilding of the tabernacle is so that the remnant of Edom, Edom were the Edomites, and they were the offspring of Esau. They were like the estranged family of the covenant people, and the Gentiles were those that were really not related in any, any noticeable way. And so God has three companies of people he, he gathers together in his lovely house. He has, he has those that are the fervent believers that are right on. They're the ones that seem to be the, the uh, no doubters. They're the, the people like, of course, they have access to God. They love God with all their heart. They are redeemed. They're righteous. Then you have the estranged Outside family members, this would be like the disgruntled people, the disheartened, discouraged, maybe people who have failed. And they would be like the category of the Edomites. They were the estranged family and then the outsiders. And so God was saying that, that through Jesus Christ, he was rebuilding this place of worship that was going to be fantastic, where no matter who comes in, they're going to have a greater access to the living God. And it's going to be a powerful place of the presence of the Lord where there's not an elaborate approach system. Just have a heart that loves God. And it's going to be an attraction to those that have been disenfranchised by religion and by form and by pain. The Edomites are going to come in and the Gentiles because God wants his house full. And so we see that, that this, this was a revelation that... Um, that was given uh, initially to Amos and then it was picked up again. So God was saying, out of my playbook, where I told you, remember way back with Amos, verses uh, 
chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Remember when I talked to you about that? This is this. Now, you say, well, do we have any precedent for that? Okay, we do with the scripture that was given in Joel 2. In the last days I'll pour out my spirit. Peter had revelation, oh, this is that, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the same way, in Acts 15, James is getting revelation, oh, this is that which was spoken by Amos, that God is going to rebuild the tabernacle of, of David. Now we see that, that in, the, in the actual worship at the tabernacle of David, so not only was there no veil there, there was all the priests could minister before it, and the people could observe, and we see that, that in the New Testament church, every born-again believer is part of the royal priesthood. And so when we, when we uh, began to worship the Lord in God's house, uh, all the priests are here. And that's why when we sing and worship, it's not meant to be a spectator sport where we watch the trained singers. No, the trained singers are here to evoke us into singing and worshiping and lifting our hands and bowing before the Lord and, lift, and dancing before the Lord and rejoicing and shouting to God. That's why we don't just remain silent. There are times we are silent. Sometimes we actually are still and we know that he is God. But many times we do what pleases him by singing to him, shouting to him, letting the children rejoice. Jesus said, permit the little children to come unto me. Okay, for such is of the, of the, of the kingdom of God. Unless you become as a little child, you can't enter the kingdom of God. So at Joy, we got little kids down here. At times, they do funny things. They get distracted. They don't always worship real well. But they're childlike and they're teachable. And there are times that they break out into such spontaneous dances of joy. And I, I believe that some of us that are older, we need to have some spontaneous breaks out. We might have to take Advil for a week, but it would be profitable for us to be as a little child. And so that's what David's tabernacle was like. And that was what Amos and, and, and um, James were saying. Hey, this is going to happen again. We see that the offerings in worship were openly observable by all the people. The exuberant worship was marked by humility, shouts, singing, bowing, kneeling, lifting of hands, Worship on instruments, speaking of prayers and praise, standing before God and dancing. Now, uh, many people who, there are, there are uh, certain uh, Christian groups that don't believe in even having instruments in, in, in church. And, and they say, well, Jesus, there's no record that Jesus had anyone play an instrument. And, uh, and the only time we see of Jesus in what we call a worship service type of thing was Jesus prayed and, and he sang a hymn with his disciples. So we know that Jesus was a tremendous worshiper. He prayed <laughs> fervently. But see, the tabernacle of David was in disrepair. Jesus didn't come to model everything that would be restored. He didn't lead his, his disciples into speaking in tongues and and, and, and he didn't particularly train them on fruit of the Spirit or gifts of the Spirit. But he did rebuild and, and, and he did purchase our salvation. Because God works line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. God is incremental in his teaching. And so the time of Jesus wasn't the time of focus for the tabernacle of David to be restored. But, but for the sacrifice to be opened for the foundation of the tabernacle of David. And so uh, if Jesus didn't sing and shout and dance and all these things, wouldn't it follow that we should sing and worship just like Jesus did? Answer, that would be logical if the Holy Spirit hadn't tipped us off to the fact that our worship expressions were to change, to emulate what was going on at David's tabernacle. See, Acts 15 just, just chronologically, Acts 15 obviously occurred after Matthew 28, after Mark 16. And, and, and so we see that, that the first four books of the New Testament are the recording of the time of Jesus. And we see in Acts uh, rec the record of what began to happen after Jesus was raised. And so the book of Acts is... is the Holy Spirit taking over and taking what Jesus had purchased and saying, here's the rest of the plan. 
See, Jesus gave us every, he purchased everything that we'll ever have. He was the epitome of the ultimate worshiper. He was the greatest worshiper because he, he laid down his own life as the ultimate act of worship. No one is a better worshiper than Jesus. But he, he sent the Holy Spirit to say, okay, church, I want you to look back several centuries ago and I want you to bring into the New Testament context something that was up and rolling according to my plan and desire so that we can bring in the disenfranchised, the Gentiles, and all the people that aren't in the game yet. And that was to restore and rebuild the tabernacle of David. So yes, if I, I respect the churches that say, well, we don't have instruments and we only sing hymns. I'm saying, God bless them. Lord, meet them at their point of faith. But my faith says I've got to read all the scripture and, and go with the most updated plan that came from the Holy Spirit. And so I don't judge critically, but I like instruments. I like hearing people uh, sing psalms, spontaneous songs of worship on stringed instruments. Piano is a stringed instrument. Guitars are stringed instruments. And, and the Bible said, you know, let them praise the Lord in the dance and play, pray, play the cymbal and the high-sounding cymbal. That's the drums. And, 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 and I do love Aaron, and I do accept him as a true believer, uh, even though he's a drummer. We, we love the drums. <laughs> we love all the instruments that, that, that are used to glorify the Lord. And so, so yes, Jesus didn't do a lot of of uh, imitation of the tabernacle of David because it wasn't going to be rebuilt yet. But there was a time and it was going to happen after and, and, and upon Acts 15 and subsequently. Secondly, the purpose of the change in worship was to open the door of access to God, to all people. Davidic worship pleases God and opens the heart of unbelievers as they experience the presence of God. So how do we respond? Do we do like, like David? Do we, we, we love the presence of God? We love to do the things that make him glad? Next week, our teaching is going to be the nine forms of worship, how we can, with our body, glorify God in worship. Today, I've mentioned most of them, but I didn't teach on how to worship in the Davidic style. But, but my question is, are you more prone to say, hey, I want to worship like David, or I would like to keep a form like they did when, when, when the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines. It never went back and joined the tabernacle of Moses, but yet many priests kept worshiping at that form. Many Christians are happy to worship without the presence of God. And so my question to you today is, what is your heart prone to do? Are you willing to worship and restore and help to restore the tabernacle of David? Or do you want to have a form without the ark? The presence of God goes where the tabernacle of David is. God bless you. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name for everyone here. Lord, that they would please you in their worship. Lord, I thank you for James in, in uh, Acts chapter 15, how he saw that you are restoring the tabernacle of David. And I pray, Lord, that your tabernacle would reap the harvest that you desire, the remnant of Edom, the Gentiles, and your people. Lord, bring them in, Lord. Round them up that we may glorify you and worship you in holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Worship you in holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Wow, that was fascinating, huh? I love listening to a good teaching, taking step by step and getting a good understanding of why and who and what and the sequence and all that. And, you know, I thought we were just all crazy when we worship here. <laughs> but we're not. Um, we've got a few more minutes of business to take care of. So bear with me for just a minute, okay? I know you guys are all anxious to go and eat. I know the... Uh, you old people that are going to, uh, what is it, Outback? You could, the original Roadhouse. Okay. Well, you old people that are going there, 
Can't wait to get there and eat. <laughs> but um, there's a couple things I want to discuss real quick. First of all, I just I have a real check in my spirit and a real encouragement for parents right now. How many of you guys think that that our nation is under assault? And even right now, especially that uh, for parents with young children and in the house of God, there's just an assault right now, and it's and it's troubling. And so just a, a word of warning, particularly this week, keep your kids close to you, okay? Listen to what I'm telling you. Keep your kids close to you. Keep a close, watchful eye, all right? And that's all I'm going to say on that. You pray about that. Um, in in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, I'm going to read a few scriptures to you. It says, Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. These things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be uh, famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Now, as we uh, get ready to close this service, we always end with an altar call. Because how many guys know that this is a lost world and people need God? If you've been following along in the uh, Bible reading plan this year, you've gone through the book of Amos. And Amos is a very troubling book because God is calling his people back to him, but they will not listen. And they will not listen. And it's not the devil that goes in and starts meddling in people's business. It's God himself that's saying, listen, I'm telling you, get back to where you know you need to be in my presence. Are you guys hearing me? Because it's very important that we catch this because God is calling people back into his presence. And for those that have never known him, he's saying it's time for you to know God now. Okay, don't be putting this thing off. America is in trouble, you guys. One of the things that uh, has been interesting, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday. God and his kingdom has managed to go, come, uh, he's, he's gone on while nations have come and gone. God and his church has, pr- has just pressed right on through. It may have seen ups and downs and through the ebbs and tides, but God and his kingdom has always made it, even though nations haven't. Is this true? And so what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is, listen, people, God is calling you to a deeper level. Pastor Steve's been telling you for the last few weeks there's been a, there's been a nationwide call to fall campaign, right? That is today. That's today. Can you guys all stand? And um, what we want to do is we want to just deal with a couple of things. First of all, we just want to invite those who have come into the house of God to hear the word of God and understand the word of God. But God's calling you into his presence. He's calling you into his family. The thing that's cool about God is that when he calls, he gives you ears to hear and he'll open up those plugged ears and you can hear the call of God. How many of you guys, you need? man, I, I remember that day. I remember that day. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was about 13 years old, but I didn't really start serving him until I was about 20 maybe 21, where I started getting more excited about serving God. And then in 33 years of marriage, you know, it's been God giving me a gift called a wife that acts like the Holy Spirit oftentimes (laughs) to say Denny. (laughs) And I have to listen. You young people, you, you got a wife, listen. And if you're still single, you have to listen to God. But God's calling you into the kingdom of God. And so today, as we're, as we're standing and we're just, we've learned about worship and, and understanding who God is and what he wants from us, you can either be drawn to God by fear about what he can do, and that's accurate, or you can be drawn to God by the promise that it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. What's it going to take for you? But I would, I would caution you, that to do nothing or to just reject God is foolish. It's foolish, especially in this day and age. There's many things out there right now that will pull people, just pull them into, into an abyss that they may or may never recover. And so I'm speaking to some of you guys here. If God has called you into this place and you're feeling God calling you, saying, man, i got to respond, and i got to respond now, then what we want to do is say, come down here, come before some of these people, and join the family of God. We're going to pray with you. It's one of the things, we do it boldly. We're in a bold world. And so we say, come into the presence of God's people and say, you know what? I need God. 
and I need God now. I can't put this off till tomorrow. I can't wait till tomorrow. If God's calling you, come on up. We're going to pray with you. Okay, come on up. We're going to pray with you. We're going to say, this is the time. This is the day. And I, I appreciate what Pastor Steve was sharing about worship. This is what we're called to do. We're going to be doing this forever, guys. We're going to be worshiping God forever. You know? Amen. How awesome. There's more of you in here today. There's more of you here that God is calling you. And you, you need to respond. You need to do it. You need to just come forward and say, you know what, pray for me. I need God. I need God. God's calling you. Now's the time. Now's the time. Amen? All righty. We're going to pray. You guys pray with me, okay? Good call. All right. Let's just pray together, okay? Father God, I love you so much. And I know that you love me. You have called me out of darkness and into your marvelous light. You said that anyone who shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe that he is the Son of God, that he died and rose again to forgive me of my sins, that person will be saved. And I am that person. And right now, I proudly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord and I am a child of God, and from this day forward, I will call upon the name of the Lord and say, yes, Jesus. Amen. I love you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You guys go down there. And I know we normally dismiss right now, but we got a, one more order of business, and this is dealing with the call um, to fall. The call to fall was uh, initiated uh, earlier this year in light of uh, today, uh, this week's Independence Day. The call to fall was an opportunity for churches throughout the nation. There's, there's probably millions of us on this day that are responding to the call to fall. And we're not talking about a call to fall into sin. We're talking about a call to fall on our knees for our nation. You know, I'm a news junkie. I like to know what's going on in, the, in our world. I try not to get caught up too much to let it, you know, affect me deeply, but I do want to know what's happening. You know, we need to know what's going on in our nation, how we ought to pray. I was talking to my mom yesterday. She reminded me of what my stepdad used to say. He said, you know, same old pile of stuff, different flies. <laughs> and we were talking about our politicians and government, and, and I look at what's going on in our government and the decisions that are being made and the, and the corruption and just, all, and I'm thinking, good Lord, Something has to change. But I also thought about Nineveh. When Jonah went to Nineveh, a whole nation fasted and got on their knees before God, and the whole nation was changed. So it can happen in our nation. I'll tell you, I love our nation. I love America. I love living here. I love coming here in freedom and independence and being able to worship God here with all my friends and family. How about you? And so this whole thing about the call to, I'm going to read a few things for you. Uh, call to fall. Uh, in corporate humility before the Lord is set for Sunday, June 30th, 2013, which is today. Why that Sunday? Because on the day before we celebrate our independence, we should also express our dependence upon the Lord. Isn't that good? Throughout this special day, we encourage believers to spend time on their knees and crying out to God to heal our souls and our land. The first scriptures, uh, why the call to fall? First, the scriptures teach it. Uh, the key verse is 2 Chronicles 7.14. You've all heard this scripture. It says, If my people who are called by my name and will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I mean, what explanation do you need to give? If my people. How many of uh, God's people are here today? Hey, just about everybody. <laughs> just about everybody. So this is an awesome day. This is what we're all doing. Millions of Americans that are saying we're going to respond. Second, our history records it. Our founding fathers blessed or sensed the need for a call to fall in view of the uh, monumental struggle we were engaged in with Britain. The First Continental Co Congress called for a day of public humiliation, fasting, and prayer through the colonies on July 20th, 1775, just after war broke out. So there was a, there's another reason why. And thirdly, our nation needs it. 
Ponder the past decade from 9-11 to war to natural disasters to financial and moral collapse. There's a lot going on in our nation right now. And I see this where there's just an assault on this young generation. There's an assault, you guys. You have to understand. People want to close their eyes and pretend nothing's happening. But it is happening before our very eyes. If you're not seeing it, then you need to get on your knees and pray, God, open my eyes and open my ears. So I will actually have a heart that's going to get soft to say, you know what, I need to intervene. And I need to quit screwing around. Because this isn't funny. People's lives are at stake. You understand what we're, what we're getting at? People's lives are at stake. So it's kind of important. Amen. And so anyway, so what we're going to do as a congregation, um, before we dismiss, we are, I'm asking you guys to join with me. We're going to get on our knees. Um, we're going to pray. And what we're going to do after we pray, you know, I'm going to just give a, a, a corporate prayer. You guys can pray with me. You guys can repent afterwards, and then you're dismissed afterwards, okay? And just a heads up, there's no Wednesday night service, all right? Heavenly Father, your word does say if your people will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, not pointing a finger at someone else, not making an excuse, not trying to give some kind of a reason why they don't have to, but Lord, if we will look to our own lives and our own behaviors and say, God, forgive me, heal me, heal my heart. Lord, where hardness or bitterness may have entered in, Lord, soften my heart and help me, God, to have that spirit of repentance. Father, as a church, Lord, I pray that we would humble ourselves as a church, Lord, and, and recognize the fact that our nation needs help, that there's lost souls and people's lives and eternity are at stake, Lord. Help us, oh God. Help us, oh God, to have, a, have eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit's saying in these days, Lord. Your word says that great darkness will cover the earth in the last days, but behold, my light will shine and it'll shine ever brighter. And so, Father, we are the children of light. We are the children of God. And Father, I pray right now that you would heal our nation, Lord. I pray, Father God, that you would, you, by your Holy Spirit, would begin to intervene in those places of public offices, Lord, where, where there's corruption and there's vice and there's and there's just darkness that is in the halls of congress in the state capitals lord and through through city government lord and we pray that there be a cleansing lord uh, in in the capitals lord and in our government that they would begin to see that the god of heaven is the one who founded this nation the god of heaven is the one who founded the church and the god of heaven is the one who founded our walk and our lives with you and so father god we turn our hearts to you and we join with the millions of people in america right now that are saying, God help us, God help us, God help us. We can't do this on our own. We are not so proud that we can just turn our backs on God. We're not so strong that we can do this on our own. Father, but we turn to you as our Lord and as our Savior, and we just declare that you are the King of kings, you're the King of this nation, you're the King of our government, and we just release you, Lord, to do your work on this nation, to do a cleansing, but even as your word says, judgment begins in the house of the Lord and cleansing begins in our own homes, Father. And let us, Father, just recognize the need to deal with things now before you come in and deal with them. It's a much better way that way. And so, Father, we just repent before you and cry out, Lord, help the families that are here, Lord, protect and guard the homes that are represented in this family, Lord. And I pray this now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't know what it's like out there, but I feel like the presence of God is all over this church right now. Take it with you. Take it home. Take some time to speak to your family and kids. Amen. God bless you.